I want people to understand this ordeal. It's taken a toll on both of us. Casey Anthony's parents respond after 15 years of allegations. I've gotten blamed for something I didn't do, and it tears me up inside. This can change our life. This is serious. This is their final response. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. Hey, honey, how was your trip to Menards? Awesome. The Menards bag sale is back. Oh, uh, what's the bag sale? You grab a bag in store and save 15% on everything you can fit in the bag. I got a new cordless drill, LED bulbs to help with the electric bill, stocked up on toothpaste, always need batteries, and paint for the mudroom, plus all my favorite snacks. Uh, where are you going? Menards, we're out of cleaning supplies. Hurry in. Grab a bag in store now through January 14th. Get 15% off everything you can fit in the bag. See store for complete details. To get the Crime Writers on After Show right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this is Crime Writers On, the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And this week, a cop rushes home to find his wife shot in the head. But what really happened? We're talking about the new podcast, The Officer's Wife. Plus, Netflix's new documentary tackles the life and crimes of football star Aaron Hernandez in Killer Inside. Join me to talk about that and a whole lot more is my real-life husband and true crime co-author, former TV journalist and love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Good evening, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Also with us is journalist, true crime author, former defense investigator, licensed private investigator, certified cat lady, and giant mushroom consumer, Laura Bricker. Hello, Laura. Hello, Rebecca. We may have to talk about that in the after show. I think um, we do. Give an education lesson on the puffball. Nobody <laughs> knows what a puffball is, Laura Bricker. And finally with us, our captain of woke cynicism, the author behind the noir novels known as the City Trilogy, and our Patreon book club host, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. <laughs> did we lose Toby? Toby? Is he dead? Did he mute himself? Did the, the he cat him. I just did a, I, I muted myself and then I did a great Southern accent, which is going to be hard to reproduce. Do it. Do it. Just <laughs> try, try it. it. Take two. How y'all doing? <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Poor Toby did it and there was silence. Yes. Like, I must have done it bad. <laughs> Nobody laughed. Where's the applause? Nobody, nobody likes it. <laughs> so, Toby, uh, there is on our Patreon, as of the time of this show dropping, a brand new book club podcast. Uh, quick elevator pitch. What is the book you guys discussed in this edition of our Patreon exclusive Balls Deep Dive Book Club podcast? All right. So, uh, it is Savage Appetites by Rachel Monroe, and it's uh, four essays about women's weird involvement in crime. And so like one of them's about a woman who ended up marrying Damien Eccles mm-hmm. um, right. from the West Memphis Three. and But she met him while he was in prison and all this. There's another one about a woman who's obsessed with the Manson case. And we had as guests, or I should say I had as guests, uh, Elise McGovern, who is a criminology professor at the University of New South Wales in Australia. And uh, Rebecca Sebastian from Dialogue and uh, the Yellow Tape True Crime Trivia. Oh yeah, we um, met her at the show. True Crime Podcast Festival. You played that when you yeah. were yeah, yeah. I not only played it, Kevin. Yeah, you won. I won. Yeah. Because I make it my mission when I go to any kind of podcast conference and I'm invited to play a game. I will win that motherfucker. Excuse my language, but it is very important to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rebecca Rebecca was like, well, maybe, you know, next time we can get just the four crime writers <gasps> up there. I'm like, no fucking way. Yes. <laughs> and then I will win and I will beat all of you. This is, so yeah. Kevin can Kevin can win in freaking crime writers against humanity. And then Rebecca can win the trivia. That's right. And it's just going to be a complete washout. But if we played basketball, Toby, you would totally kill us. So whatever. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but just know that we are never playing basketball with you. So Two on two hoops. <laughs> never. Um, <laughs> never. Never, never, Crime never. writers on a basketball court. <laughs> wow. I, you know, Toby, 
I used to play basketball, I have to say. Oh, you did? Um, All right. So I, I, I you, did. You can yeah. be on my team. You and I will take on Rebecca and Kevin. Laura, we can then have a dressage competition and you can kick all of our yes. asses. Okay. Well, there you go. I would like to see uh, Kevin doing some dressage. I can be on your team because I know how to walk and trot <laughs> at least. And then Kevin can just sneeze the entire time because I think he's a little bit allergic to horses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And then uh, the third person is Amy Schlossberg. Yeah. Who did direct appeal and now she does women in crime. Yeah. And yeah, so that's it. It's a, uh, it's a good conversation and I think people will enjoy it. And then the next book is something called Adnan story oh. by Rabia Chaudhry. By who? What? Adnan who? Yes. Adnan who? What? Adnan. <laughs> Adnan story. So I'm actually, it's, it's funny cause I'm listening to it on audio and uh, Rabia reads it. I know. So I don't think I've ever like had a, Friend, read an audiobook <laughs> while I'm driving around. It's a little strange. It's like the Seinfeld where George needs to hear himself reading these books. Oh, Toby, uh, it's it's Rabia Chaudhry. You still haven't had a friend read an audiobook. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, harsh. she likes Toby now. Now, yes. And then she's met him. Now. She'll like everyone once she meets him. It's like them. the first time I've, I've met her in person. And I went up to her. I didn't know if she knew what it was. Like, hey, my name's Kevin Flynn. And I, she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she gave me a big hug and we talked. And she said, I really would like to meet Toby so I could shake him. <laughs> <laughs> Shaking Toby syndrome. Shaking Toby. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Much has passed. Well, I think that's going to be a great episode. I can't wait to uh, hear you record it and then also hear Henry edit it and tell me all about how good it was before I get to listen to it. <laughs> now, Kevin, you have another announcement you want to make before we start the show, right? Yeah, very briefly. The four of us are hitting the road again. Oh, no. We are going to be appearing at the 2020 True Crime Podcast Festival. And it's in flyover country, right? It's in Kansas City, yes. Missouri. And by the way, I do not mean that as a derisive term. I what used to live it? in Kansas, not Kansas City, Missouri, but I used to live in what? Kansas when I was a child. I call it a flyover wow. country. Wow, flyover country. <laughs> America's well, breadbasket. That's, I have to tell you. The last time I was out there, so I was, that was, my book is actually the guy that was murderer. He's from that area. Really? And I had, yes, he's, he's from uh, the capital of Missouri. And apparently I say Missouri wrong. People say Missouri. I, it's I Missouri. Say it, whatever. Missouri. Missouri. And, is, and isn't Missouri. the capital of Missouri, um, Jefferson City. Jefferson City. You're yes. the one who Remember, I, the I, capitals. I learned all the capitals as my um, New Year's resolution like three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> So, so but anyway, here's the thing. <laughs> anyway, the last time I went, I had an angry mob that was after me and these Midwestern librarians had to protect me. So who's nice. going to fill that role this time if they show up, Toby? <laughs> Not Toby. <laughs> Not Toby. Toby. Flat Toby. <laughs> <laughs> Flat Toby, maybe. So everybody can write this down. Uh, the dates are July 11th and 12th. We're at the Lowe's Hotel in downtown Kansas City. And uh, we'll be telling you more as the, uh, the time gets close. And we're going to have ticket giveaways for... Um, our Patreon listeners. Nice. All right, so join our Patreon. You get tickets to see us in Kansas City, Missouri. And we are going to be going to that festival again, which was super fun last time. And we'll have more about that in the future. All right, are you guys ready to start our first review of the evening? Mm-hmm. 3542 to 3015. Just fast, The new podcast from Vault Studios and Eleven Alive is The Officer's Wife. It begins with audio of Georgia patrolman Matthew Boynton rushing to his apartment, fearing his wife Jessica may be injured inside. And I can't get an answer to the door. Police are I think my kids are in the closet too. Police department. Host Brendan Keith tells us local police and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation believed the shot to Jessica Boynton's head was self-inflicted. But there were irregularities about the case, including neighbors hearing two shots, the angle of the wound, and that she was found resting on a pillow within a closet which was locked from the inside. But what really happened inside that closet and in the hours and minutes before the shots rang out? People do things that don't make sense when, and, and under stress and under dynamic situations. Their crumbling marriage was no secret. The high school sweethearts were ready to call it quits. But was Jessica Boynton at the point of no return? Nothing in my mind said that she was suicidal. In my mind, I knew she was upset and dealing with maybe some minute depression. But who wouldn't when your husband's cheating on you? That would hurt anybody. 
The officer's wife uses audio from police radios and body cameras to give listeners an as-it-happens look at the investigation. Just as you think the story of Jessica Boynton's shooting will be typical by the numbers true crime tale, it offers a real plot twist. Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about plot points from the officer's wife. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes for our thumbs up or thumbs down review. Now, Laura, I have a question for you. I don't want to say woman to woman because that's like weird, but I'm going to say it woman to woman. Have you ever had a friend in an abusive relationship? Oh, I probably have. Yeah. Um, Not to the extent of this one. Yeah. But I have had friends in very unhealthy relationships where it was very obvious to everybody else what was going on. But the person at the time maybe didn't want to leave or didn't see the situation as being, you know, what friends might have seen. Yes. Well, one of the things that really strikes me about this case and the way that it's laid out in the podcast, I know there's other media also that explored the story, and we'll talk about that in a second. But Matthew Boynton does what is, um, I've had two close friends, one in particular that I thought of all the time while listening to this podcast, that were in relationships similar to the one described in this podcast. And the one thing that Matthew Boynton, um, the police officer husband in this that it was such like a hallmark of, I mean, it was really visceral for me to to hear it, was his preemptive gaslighting techniques of sort of setting the stage for his later being perceived as a victim. I mean, him like basically trying to write a memo to self. Yes. By, by you know, calling the police when they had an argument, saying she did something to him or, or going yeah. to his grandfather or just telling people constantly that she was abusive to him and all that. Laura, what did you feel about those tactics that we hear this police officer used, you know, during the course of their relationship and then later was able to point to, see, there was this and there was this and there was this. Ugh, I fucking hate this guy. Let me just tell you guys, I have a blister in the middle of my foot from walking so much listening to this podcast because it made <laughs> me so angry that... I have a blister in a spot I've never even gotten a blister before because I was walking around and I was just getting enraged because as you listen to it from the outside, you're like, how does nobody know that this guy is so full of shit? The way that he's like documenting everything right down to the night that she allegedly shot herself, allegedly tried to commit suicide. He conveniently had dinner plans with his cop friend. Oh, they went to Walmart and got in a fight. He conveniently called the cops to document it and everything else. I was just like, but listening to over and over again, the way that like he like strategically laid out all of these things that he could later point to as evidence that it was her, not him. And I was like, oh, I was like just boiling listening to this because it was just awful. And thank God for her grandmother who, you know, the grandmother was like right on things. But um, it just absolutely horrific to listen to. And then the way that the police officers, his, you know, even the ones that aren't friends with him buy into that was even more maddening. They went into it questioning her like she was a suspect because of all of these little crumbs that he had thrown out there. Now, I did want to start with that question, full transparency, because I do think it's important to just sort of talk about the fact that there is a larger story here. There's a story about domestic violence. There's a story about the... um, There's a lot of data that shows that domestic violence is more common in relationships where one of the partners is in law enforcement, where the husband is in law enforcement than not. Uh, Wives of people in law enforcement are four times as likely to be in a relationship with a domestic abuser than the rest of the population. There's a lot there that, let's be real, this podcast is not talking about. Yeah. (laughs) But there has been other reporting around this story. Toby, I know that you're thinking about this. There has been reporting around this particular story that does highlight all of those things. Toby, can you just talk a little bit about sort of the difference between the other reporting that you've read and this podcast? So, I mean, I think the main other piece about this case was in The New Yorker uh, a few months ago uh, by a writer named Rachel Aviv. And what she did, and she credits Brendan Keefe, who's the host of this podcast, uh, for doing a lot of the investigative work. Right. And then she takes this story and connects it to a bunch of other issues. Uh, one of which is what you were talking about, about domestic violence and domestic violence and law enforcement. 
Also, you know, as I think we're about to find out in in the podcast about how partner violence against men or women are 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 held differently in the family court so that women who are accused of domestic violence are much less likely to get custody than men who are. And then the other thing, which again, I don't know if they're going to eventually get to this, but you know, the grandfather actually plays like a pretty big role in all this in that he he like has this weird combination of carrying a lot of weight in the county uh, as being an important guy, but he's also a little bit callow. And there's a he has a subordinate who basically runs roughshod, and I, I believe he sexually assaulted some women and basically seemed like he was fairly lawless. And uh, the grandfather, who's the sheriff, just you know won't make a move to stop him. So he's weirdly accommodating and he's got so much power that this is kind of like even beyond just being a policeman that Matthew has this sort of legendary grandfather who all the other law enforcement people respect. And that's sort of part of his ability to potentially get away with it Hmm. and why it takes an investigative reporter coming in to sort of confront them with like these kind of ridiculous facts that you you hear I guess it's the captain of the of the the town police force trying to explain away in the most lame possible manner Griffin Georgia police chief Mike Yates Matthew's boss who called in the GBI to investigate says those texts are not for him to try to understand I don't reconcile it. I rely on the investigator that was conducting the investigation to determine what the relevance of that was. Is it something that you or I would do? Probably not. But we don't know what was going on in his mind at the time, nor what he actually thinks was taking place. You know, if she and apparently um, his estranged spouse has a history of saying and doing things that are a little far out there. I'm sure he was concerned for his children. I'm sure he was concerned for his estranged spouse, whatever the relationship was. But I I speculate that he probably didn't take it as seriously as someone might. That's in his mind and in the determination of the people that did the investigation. Now, Kevin, I do want to talk about I mean, I think we have to. We we know this is like a story with a larger purpose and that it was told in a different way in The New Yorker and that Brandon Keefe himself did some reporting, you know, for a different outlet before this podcast came out that had impact. But we have to talk about how this podcast was made. And to my ear, there are some serious deficiencies. And I'm wondering what you think about the fact that the podcast relies, by the way, Brendan Keefe, the narrator of this podcast, is almost not present. Like, he's just a framing narrator. I, before I read it and read all the notes about it, got the background information, didn't even realize he was the original investigator of Portland, because he doesn't introduce himself that way. He's not present in the story that way. He doesn't talk about his role in reporting the story at all. And the podcast itself really leans on these protracted pieces of tape from police interviews and body cam footage and long phone conversations without narration sort of coming in and telling us either what it means or casting doubt when, as a listener, I realize someone's lying, but like no one tells me, remember, this probably isn't true because X, Y, Z. What do you think about it, just how this is put together? Well, first of all, I want to say I think that the opening was the most dramatic opening of any podcast I can remember listening to. Really? Yeah. I mean, it was just a real thriller. It had my heart pumping. I wanted to know what was going on. A police officer crouches silently waiting for backup. 3542 to 3015. It's after midnight and neighbors are sleeping. It's quiet all around except for his own heavy breathing. Just past 3015. 10-4 DB officers in a 21 unit at this time. The last few weeks are a blur now. The fights, the slamming doors, the talk of divorce, the plans to reach out to lawyers and figure out what to do next. Right now, none of that matters. This is all that matters. <laughs> I think a couple of times, I'm thinking of the uh, the second episode where it's primarily this inter- the interview with Matthew Boyden. There were sort of long passages. It could have been edited tighter. We could have had more of Brendan coming in, giving context around what Matthew's saying, or broken that up 
orally. But otherwise, I mean, I think that, that they've made use of the tape and the body cam video audio. I, th- I thought they did a good job with all of that. But what do you think about, like, the, the narrative structure and sort of the big pieces that, as a listener, you're thinking about? I mean, let me give you an example. They set this up like she's dead. And you yeah. find out in episode four. The end of episode three. That she's alive. Yeah, big twist. It's To me, it's not a twist. To me, it's actually like an omission. I mean, I, I don't feel no, like it was set up like, like a... But I don't it wasn't like even set all. up like a twist. Everyone refers to her in the past tense. Like the interview subjects, everyone refers to her in the past tense constantly. Do they? They do. I'd have to go back and listen. There's a lot of things like that. I mean, there's just a lot of threads that just sort of get dropped... I guess you're not hearing it the same way that I am then. No, absolutely not. I think we're listening to two different things. I mean, I was kind of conscious of that just because I knew, because I'd read the article beforehand, so I kind of knew what was going on. And I felt like most of the time when she's been referred to in the past tense is because they're talking about the way she was, Mm. you know? So it was like, and, and I think it may actually be that same way in the article where it's like she had long hair, she was this, she was that. And it's mostly talking about her before they got married or in the past. So it's constantly in the past tense. I, I kind of agree with you in that it, it sort of seems a little artificial, but it didn't bug me uh, the way sometimes those things where it feels like they're really withholding information that they ought to give you. Like in this particular case, for whatever reason... I guess maybe it was just the way it was set up and you weren't going past the events that were happening. You weren't looking back on it. They were trying to walk you through it that not knowing that she survived didn't seem all that unfair. Yeah, it's it's funny about everybody referring to her in the past tense because they're referring to her past. Yeah. And it's funny because they're doing the thing that kind of annoys me a bit, which is they're doing all of their narration in the present tense. Even when they're talking about things in the past, that's a, something I've talked about before. But I feel like if you press pause towards the end of the first episode and you said, okay, Kevin, what do you think is happening in the story and what's it going to be about? And I'm going to say, oh, it's going to be that uh, there are irregularities at the scene and that it's really the cop and it's sort of a typical run-of-the-mill true crime story like that. It's actually the husband and he tried to hide stuff and it's this and that. And by all of a sudden bringing in the fact that she's alive— and we think that maybe she could answer some of these questions. It makes it a different story. I just say as a narrator, just to drop that bit, like in the middle of the first episode, and say, yeah, she was shot, but she survives. Just seems like a cheap giveaway. Laura, what do you think? Yeah, I actually liked it because I, I hadn't read the New Yorker piece uh, before I started this. I've read it now, which has made me more enraged. But when I started this, I hadn't. So I'm going into this listening, thinking, she's dead. Wow. And this guy is an asshole, and he's going to get away with it. And then all of a sudden... That episode at the end where they drop it right at the end that she's alive, I could not wait to hear the next episode to hear what she had to say. So I think it was a really effective tool in terms of keeping your interest up to keep you listening. Um, Because for me, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. She's not dead? Holy shit. What's she going to say? What's happening next? So I just thought it sort of upped the suspense a little bit. It reminds me when they said that Mary Boyle had a twin sister. <laughs> she what? It was the same thing. Yes. You were well, like, wait, what in the last 30 seconds? <laughs> See, I think I would be more gen- generous mm-hmm. about the way that was revealed if there weren't so many other big, sloppy storytelling mishaps for like me what? anyway. Well, for instance, uh, there's a long narrative about the text messages Mm -hmm. that Jessica, the wife, sent the husband, allegedly she sent him, while she's having these suicidal thoughts, while he's driving around to meet his friend at uh, two in the morning at Waffle House or whatever time of day it was. And they never say, like, where was her phone? Is it a possibility that he sent these texts from her phone? They don't even, like, touch on it or explore it. And those are just gaping obvious questions that the listener is wondering the other the other thing is the description of actually the scene where she was found in the closet with the door it's like all this stuff comes up later where it's like maybe she was shot maybe she wasn't shot they never tell us until later that the gun was under the pillow like where was the gun where was this there was that they're like there was no gunshot residue on her hands whatever all these little things are dropped in without any like, I, I feel like I have all these questions much, much earlier that are obvious, like, narrative questions. What did the crime scene look like? Was she shot? Is she dead? 
it was her cell phone there. And they sort of have these things that sort of are designed to make us wonder without the facts to support whether or not we should be wondering. I mean, that to me is my complaint about how this was put together. Toby, I know the cell phone thing in particular, you also sent a note about that. It seems like a glaringly obvious question that anybody listening to this would wonder about, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's, in in some ways, it's the key question, right? If he's the one who's using the phone, I don't don't know what his defense would be. Mm. It seemed like it needed to be addressed. And it's either this is where the phone was or we don't know where the phone was. Kind of letting you in on that because it is. I mean, it's the big question. And so you're, at least until you find out that she's alive, it's in the back of your mind. It's like, okay, well, when are they going to find the phone? Right. Like, why aren't they looking for the phone? Why isn't that the big thing? Especially when... The neighbors are like, no, the shots were fired at a completely different time. And then we saw them running out of the house. Yeah. And I mean, that's that's, that's, that's another example, Toby, because the neighbors, Megan and her husband, talk about hearing the shots. I believe they said like 1030 or whatever. And then the other witnesses, the other neighbors heard the shot say 1130. The narrator, uh, Brendan, says... You know, the cops say it happened after midnight and these two neighbors say something different. He never addresses that the two neighbors said things that were an hour apart from each other. Like, so to me, as a listener, I hear is there's a lot of confusion. Like the the cop story says it happened after he arrived home. It would be after 1230. The best friend Megan and her husband both say it's between 10 and 11. But these other neighbors say it's between 11 and 12. That's an hour that's not nothing. Mm-hmm. And the podcast just sort of treats the listener like we're dumb and we won't notice those things in some ways. Uh, that's how I felt about it. Or are they it. just putting it out there? I don't know. Maybe they are, but they don't actually even say they're putting it out there. That's the question. They're not saying, so these two neighbors have different stories and the police has a third story. They're just saying the neighbors disagree with the police, mm-hmm. but they're not even noticing that the neighbors agree with each other. You know what I mean? But Laura, I have another question for you. Um about just sort of what happened to Jessica. Yeah. Because there's also a big question of whether or not she was even shot, which was shocking to me. How can you not know if somebody was shot or not? So I didn't think it was up for debate whether she'd been shot. I thought it was up for debate whether she, I guess I missed that part because I was more fixated on the doctors in the ER saying she wasn't shot self-inflicted that it wasn't something because of the angle at which she was shot in the head so that was the part that i was sort of finding interesting in terms of they they went so far as to write you know a pretty detailed narrative about that because they felt strongly like this didn't make sense that if she was coming in for a self-inflicted gunshot one first of all she was using the wrong hand not her dominant hand and that she was shot from the top which again um, didn't add up. So I, where did, I guess I missed the part about her not being shot. I didn't miss that, right? I, I didn't get that wrong, right? No, I think it was the ER doctor or one other. They don't even know if she was shot or not. said it, it doesn't it look more to them like a blunt, force, blunt trauma. force trauma. But that's crazy too, yeah. But just the fact that then that the police that were investigating, it sounds like even though these doctors went out of their way to be like, uh, we have some serious questions about this report and what actually happened to her. They're like, eh, whatever. <laughs> you know, like, we're not going to take the doctors, the experts' opinion. We're just going to sort of close this out. Was it, we're going to close it out in three weeks and make quick work of it or whatever they said? I was mm. like, Burr. yeah. <laughs> well, Megan, by the way, the the friend, the, the best friend, who was like a primary source for this story, and was also, you know, Jessica's a good friend and provide us a lot of like the background of what's happening in the marriage and so forth. Another detail they drop in at the like to episode four is she's also a trained EMT and like first responder. And it's like, wait, what? Because the way she set up to us is like she's like a pregnant neighbor. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's like a lot of that kind of stuff in, in terms of details. Um, now, it sounds to me that you wanted everything laid out in episode. No, one. if they're supposed to be twists. To me, they're not set up as twists. They're just set up as facts that are... Maybe it's because Brendan's narration is so matter-of-fact and there's so much tape without like a lot of structure around it. You know how I looked at it? It's like at certain details as I'm listening to it and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Like, I wonder what's going on with that. It's kind of like you're going along as it's sort of happening in a way. And I, I sort of took it, and I guess I this will come back you know, in my face if it's not how they're actually doing it, that <laughs> these details are going to be revealed as they go along as they find more information and pursue more information they're going to be like and then we found out this from back you know like they were going to sort of follow up on some of these things because it didn't disrupt the narrative for me it was just more like huh 
I'm curious about that, but I bet they're going to get to that type thing. So hmm. hopefully they do get to it. it. It didn't bother me as much as it bothers you. Uh, I think it bothers me more than it bothered Lara and Kevin. I, I, I just think, you know, I don't think they anticipated what the listener's questions might be hmm. going along or what would help the listener, like, not get antsy right. about things. Right. You know, again, they could have just been like, yeah, the cell phone seems like a big deal. We're going to get to it. Right. Or something. Exactly. Just so that you had confidence that it was going to be resolved. Whereas right now, it's like, I don't even know, like, the last time they talked about the cell phone. And they certainly haven't talked about, like, where where was it? It's just been those texts were sent, and they might not have been by her. And they let Megan, in one of the interviews with her, talk about the lock on the closet door. Because I don't know, I know, I was wondering, weren't you all wondering? Like, one of the very, like, weird details is that Jessica was inside of a closet that was locked from the inside, right? The closets have locks on the inside? Yeah. What's this? Right, but that's because our old uh, person who lived here was cheap and just used like a recycle really? handle or handle. Yes, just saying. I locked the door inside closet C or <laughs> the closet door here in studio. But, C. but it's but it's one of those things that like they don't acknowledge the listener might be wondering about. So like, thank you for locking and unlocking that. It was very uh, good foley there. One of the things I was wondering was, you know, many questions I have is why would they have a closet in their house that locks from the inside? Did they just buy a cheap door handle because their other door handle broke and it happened to have locks on two sides, kind of like our studio? Mm. Did did Jessica perhaps create a place where she could go in and lock herself in if her husband was angry, like a little like safe room? And then Megan throws out this theory that like she thinks that the husband switched the locks between like the bathroom and the closet at the last minute before the police got there, locking it from the inside to make her look like she locked from the inside, which is an interesting theory. If that were me, it would have taken seven hours. <laughs> I'd have the wrong screwdriver. You're not handy. I'd, yeah. I guess like, oh, it's the wrong size and the. Yeah. You'd be like, whatever, I'm just going to jail for it's murder. Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, what do you think? Oh, no, I just thought when I was listening to it, I was like, don't they, they live in an apartment building, right? Like like an apartment complex. Or like, yeah. I, I, so I just thought like apartment complex and it's a door where whatever happened, I'm not going to speculate, even though I have my theories. After it happens, somebody just turns the door lock on the inside and slams the door shut. I mean, to me, that seemed like the logical explanation for the whole thing. It's funny that you say you're not going to speculate because, you know. But I just speculated. That's No, what no, I did. no. It's fine because I'm just thinking about I'm going back to that sort of twist where Jessica is still alive. You know why I just realized it doesn't work for me as a twist? Why? Because she doesn't actually remember anything. They're asking her to speculate. So it would be a twist if like. Guess what? She's still alive, and she and that changed everything. Aha! It was the girlfriend. But or, it yeah. didn't change anything that she was still alive. The facts remain the same. The question, yeah. you know what I mean? Sort of. Right. And we're all left to speculate <laughs> anyway, because no arrest has been made. There's officially no crime here. Mm. Go ahead, Toby. Oh, I just feel like the story that she tells about the last thing she remembers just seemed really convincing to me. Like that was exactly the kind of conflict that it seems like they set up as as possibly happening, where she's like, I'm going to take the dog for a walk in the rain. Can you look after the newborn? And he's like, no. And she's like, well, screw you. I'm going to put him in bed and you can listen to him cry. Yeah. And that escalating into something yeah. seemed to me absolutely believable. To me, that, that, that did answer some questions. Mm. And I, I mean, it's not like proof of anything, but it did provide a narrative that made sense with everything else we know. And if nothing else, it underlined the fact that Matthew Boynton is a super asshole. Even if that's the only bad thing he did that day, it's still a super dick thing to do. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's Everything ridiculous. he did sounded super dick-like. In your opinion. Oh, no, he's a super asshole. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead, Matthew Boynton. Come at me. You're a super asshole who will like let her, you're the mother of your baby, like, like, not walk the dog. It's ridiculous. Anyway. All right. Well, let's do what we do. Let's give our thumbs up or thumbs down review to The Officer's Wife. It's the latest podcast from a burgeoning network. Vault, we've actually reviewed another podcast they made relatively recently called Bardstown, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's do what we do. Let's give it a thumbs up or thumbs down to our listeners. Check it out. Laura Bricker, what do you think? Uh, I'm going with thumbs up because, uh, you know, Doug Evans has kind of died down in my world. I'm not <laughs> as angry at him now that he stepped back doing carpentry. This guy, Matthew Boynton, has taken the place of Doug Evans and listening to this podcast really upped my rage walking game in the last week. So um, I'm interested to see where it goes. I mean, right now we're sort of straightforward. I'm hoping it does 
take on a little bit bigger issue with regard to like domestic violence uh, in law enforcement on a, on a larger scale. Um, but right now, it's it's definite rage walking material. Toby Ball, what about you? Thumbs up or thumbs down for the officer's wife? You know, it's it's a it's a close one for me. I, I guess I'm a thumbs up. I think for the most part, it's competently told. I mean, I think there's some sort of glaring things. I like the idea behind Vault, which is getting these local reporters and, and the stories that they've covered, and then turning them into podcasts and giving these you know local reporters a chance to tell the story that they reported uh, to a larger audience. I think that's a cool idea. I guess I kind of wish that they were a little more hands-on and helpful maybe in crafting some of this stuff because I think the reporting that was done on this story is good and interesting. And, you know, again, the idea that it's not completely clear to us that the host was a guy who broke all this stuff, you know, I, I just think that could be a little more intentional. So it's it's a thumbs up. I mean, I, I did I thought it was – Decent to listen to. Uh, it's flawed, but it's not bad. What about you, Kevin? Uh, I'm a thumbs up. I think this is a good bounce back for Vault Studios after Bardstown, which I thought was uh, wasn't put together in a good way. Again, I thought the opening was super dramatic. They've got a lot of good tape uh, from the investigators and uh, some interesting interviews. No, it's not perfect, and I would like to hear where this goes and how it finishes up. Sometimes we like to get into these um, while they're still hot and talk about them and not wait until they're over. I kind of wish that we had waited until this was over to review it because I would like to know if they stick the landing. But all in all, I'd give uh, the officer's wife a thumbs up. I'm a thumbs down for this podcast. I don't blame the journalist uh, for this, Brendan Keefe. I think his reporting was solid. Based on Toby's notes, I did go back and look at some of the other reporting on this. I really am very curious about how the sausage is being made in this studio vault. I mean, I think that, like Toby said, the concept is very interesting. Taking local stories, making like Wondery style hit podcasts. They feel very much like a podcast, a TV pipeline. These podcasts, they have that feeling, that sort of slight like... Dirty John, uh, Dr. Death, like wondery feeling, using lots of tape, just doing a straight narrative beginning to end. However, I believe they are actually taking the journalism down a notch or two or three in the storytelling. It sounds like audio producers are telling reporters, this is how to my ear, are saying to a reporter like Brandon, hey, I know you reported this story to this, this and this, but this is how it works for a podcast. And the person who's making those decisions actually is not taking the journalism and the storytelling and putting it up front. Like, that is not the priority. The priority is salacious tape and the priority is twists and turns and not thinking about what the listener might be thinking about, worrying about, questioning. It feels like a nascent, like, baby stage studio. There are some high value things here, but there's just not enough I found myself very dissatisfied with the storytelling in this and feeling like it's doing the reporting disservice. I just want to say one other thing that I think is very important. There is a unfortunate pattern in reporting around stories involving domestic violence in particular that I think podcasts in particular feel like they need to do this he said, she said, well, maybe it happened this way or maybe it happened this other way thing. When they actually know the real story is there's domestic violence here and there's a pattern and that, you know, in law enforcement, especially this is a real problem. This podcast is doing domestic violence storytelling. No favors in the way that it's doing it. There's no crime here. But they are asking. There's no charges here. They got to wait. They can't just. I understand yeah. that. But the way they are even framing it to me is doing a disservice to the story at large. They should be talking about not just the patterns been this couple, but the patterns sort of in the in you know the larger context. I find that very disappointing and kind of a disservice. So anyway, thumbs down for me. Moving on. No one has allegedly murdered two people and then played an entire season as a professional athlete. I can't wait to be free. Aaron Hernandez from Bristol, Connecticut. I play at Bristol Central High School. Aaron Hernandez was a different level of athlete. He was kind. He wasn't someone who picked on other kids. He's one of the best players in America. Get him the ball. The Patriots reward him with a $40 million contract. 
Aaron Hernandez was a ticking time bomb. In 2018, Wondery and the Boston Globe Spotlight team produced one of the year's best podcasts, Gladiator. It took a deep dive into the case of an NFL star implicated in separate homicide cases. Now Netflix is offering up a three-part documentary, Killer Inside the Mind of Aaron Hernandez. The why is the story here. He was out to prove something. Like a tough guy all the time. He had a second residence. The flop house. He had trouble with drugs, with guns. Aaron was absolutely operating on the edge. New England Patriots. The documentary follows Hernandez's childhood as a closeted teen athlete and troubled college star, not equipped for life as a professional football player. It also lays out the investigation into the murder of Odin Lloyd and the fatal shooting of two men outside of a Boston nightclub. How can an individual who has everything get involved in something like this? I was the happiest little kid in the world, and you fucked me up. I ain't living with that. You did! I had nobody. What do you think I was going to do? Become a perfect angel? The documentary also touches on the subjects of gay athletes and traumatic brain injuries. Gladiator fans will be familiar with the killer inside's newer findings, namely the interviews with childhood friends discussing Hernandez's sexuality and unguarded jailhouse phone calls with friends and family. Killer Inside is also a revealing look at a troubling life visually elevated in a way that only a documentary can be. Now, spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about plot points from Killer Inside. So if you want to hear our spoiler-free reviews, go to the estimated time code listed in our show notes. Laura, uh, podcast, a documentary, I think a lot of it tracks on the same track. For you, what is the main difference between consuming this story in documentary format versus a podcast? Um, well, for me, I am not a football person, so it was actually helpful to have some video to kind of put some of the stories into context. I just felt like this was a little bit more like superficial in terms of like the straightforward kind of TV style that you would see on any sort of news you know, magazine type program, whereas the podcast went a little deeper. So I think for me, it was helpful to sort of see the people in person, see some of the, the you know, witnesses and the clips of the football. And I watched it with Ken and I was like, oh, so was this guy like he was with Gronk? Was he good? And he's like, oh, he was really good. I'm like, I don't know. So I think just seeing some of the actual video clips helped me kind of understand a little bit more sort of the, the, the I don't call it mystique, but sort of this star power that surrounded Aaron Hernandez at the time that he was playing for the Patriots um, here in New England, where we live. And when this all came out and when this happened. You know, with football players, sometimes because they're wearing helmets when they're playing, it may be hard to identify them if they're not on your home team. But I think part of what the documentary brings is the video and what you can see when you see the different takes of Aaron Hernandez, without seeing it, you probably wouldn't believe how he could also look very menacing, but also very childlike in other situations, mm. where he's happy and playing ball, and he's just, he looks like a big, goofy kid. And, other, and in other situations, you see him, and he looks you know, like a real dangerous gangster. And I think without the visual, that's what you're missing. You, it, It's easier to, to believe the multiple sides of his personality when you can visually see him. I think Laura has a point with the, the sports angle, though. I mean, one of the things that's impressive about this documentary is they did get a lot of actual football footage, which we know mm -hmm. is not cheap and, um, you know, really demonstrates. And for me, the really stunning footage is it's really hard to quantify because you say like a great football player, young football player, undeveloped football player. Aaron Hernandez really was a superior talent. You see this footage of him mm -hmm. playing in high school on a good high school team that also like brought his brother oh God, yeah. to a college football career. I mean, it's like very, very good high school football team. He looks like a 30 year old playing with six year olds like he and is a, he's a drag superior. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, like he just is superior. Yep. And that's something the podcast said but we couldn't see, and the documentary helps us see it. You know, that being said, I think the podcast also had the power of the Boston Globe spotlight team behind it, and this had, you know, the documentarians who I think without the podcast, if, if we weren't comparing the two, did a, a good 
sort of overview and a good job with it. But Toby, what do you think? You know, listen, watching this documentary relatively soon after we reviewed the podcast, how did you compare the two in terms of like the media and the way the story was told? You know, I thought the the Boston Globe podcast was a lot angrier. I feel like in my, you know, one of my main criticisms of the Netflix documentary is I, I think they just give too many people a pass. Like who? I, I, the big ones, I think, are... Urban Meyer in the University of Florida. Yes, agreed. And then I think uh, the Patriots. Agreed. And for people who don't live in the United States, who don't follow sports very much, you know, the Patriots have had like the greatest 12 year run 12. in professional football. Almost 20. Or 15, yeah. whatever it is. Like a very long run of success, uh, the greatest in professional football history. And the way they've done it, among other things, is they've just paid like insane attention to detail and they've been absolutely, you know, I wouldn't say that there's, there's no loyalty, but they basically, when you're, when your time is done with the Patriots, they just let you go regardless of, you know, what you've done in the past, right? It, it's sort of unsentimental, I guess that's the term. Yes. Mm-hmm. And Toby, just to interrupt for a second, the other thing that yeah. the Patriots are known for Bill Belichick, who sort of scouts talent and recruits for the Patriots, it's sort of not that different from the coach in the Netflix show Cheer. He kind of like does like the land of broken toys model of recruiting where he's like, I see a person that is vulnerable but talented that I could perhaps mold and make what I want them to be, which isn't the same as another recruiting coach who might be like, I just want an all around talented, good teammate Who's going to add something like Bill Belichick has a thing where he wants someone he wants to indoctrinate. It's not just recruiting. It's indoctrination. Right. Yeah. But I, but I you know, I think there's with with Hernandez, who, again, you know, he's in some ways not completely typical of a of a patriot in that they've always had these guys who do certain things really well. Like Hernandez was just a top, top athlete who could do a whole bunch of things well at his position. But the idea that they didn't know about all these red flags. They knew, yeah. And that Robert Kraft is saying, you know, he felt betrayed. I mean, that, that, that's just clearly, that, that that's not true. I mean, at a very minimum, and this is like giving them as much credit as possible, when he asked to be traded because he didn't feel like he was safe and they moved into that other house, there was no way they did not do the investigation to find out right. what the story was. There's a lot of money investigated in that guy. So- one of the things I really liked about the Boston Globe podcast is that they were not afraid to go there. And they, they went hard on the University of Florida, too. And they don't pay quite as much attention to the University of Florida, I think, in this documentary. But it's another case where he is acting erratically. And in the podcast, I believe they sort of hint that he may have been involved in another shooting when he was in Gainesville, yes. and that it was kind of brushed under the rug by the team lawyer who deals with all their criminal stuff. When I was watching this, it really seemed like they kind of gave a little lip service. They made they made Bob Kraft look bad a couple times, but for the most part, they had a lot of talking heads say, "This is on him." You know, it's not on CTE. It's not on these other people or whatever. Plenty of people are in this situation. And, you know, that's fine, but he did go to these huge, powerful institutions in their area, like the Patriots and University of Florida football, and was completely enabled because he was a stud on the field. And if he was some replaceable guy, if he was average or below average, I I don't think this stuff would have happened. Mm. Well, I don't, I mean, maybe he would have committed all these crimes, but he certainly would not have been either protected or had the, or had the head turned the other way. So look, I, I, I don't think you can lay it on the pats and say, you know, they're responsible for it. I, to me, the, the biggest moment as far as their potential culpability is when he asks to be traded away from Boston and they're like, no, 
And at that point, it seems I, I, th- there's a different calculation going on. I would like um, to talk about the black cat that showed up on his surveillance footage. I need more information <laughs> about that. Number one. I, I, when I he saw put, that too. Yeah. yeah. When he put all his surveillance cameras up, I'm like, wow, he's like even filming inside his house. I mean, that was interesting to me that he became so paranoid after this sort of, you know, situation, you know, the, uh, well, it wasn't a situation. Wasn't it after one of the um, murders? Yes. Yeah, when he installed all those. But yeah, I was like, okay, we get the black cat. Also, I didn't know from the podcast, how did I miss this? That Hernandez's fiance, her sister, was dating the guy. Odin Lloyd. Odin Lloyd. Lloyd. Yeah. I guess yeah. I missed that yeah. part before. I'm like, huh, okay. No, the um, whole thing is the situation around the murders is so and, strange. Wait, and his mother ran off with his cousin's husband after his yes. dad died? Mm-hmm. What the fuck? I'm like, there was so much family drama in this that, again, was just sort of told in a very straightforward, I mean, you know, it was a what the fuck way. But, you know, overall, I just think this whole documentary was so much more straightforward, traditional news magazine style. Yeah, it just had that more sort of investigation discovery style where they didn't get into so much of the backstory. Although... There was a lot with, I thought this was interesting. I, you know, I feel like that the bisexuality was played up a lot more in this than it was in the podcast. I don't know if yes. you guys felt like that. How um, are we 20 minutes into this review and you haven't brought up the San Susies? Go ahead. Talk about it. The high school quarterback yes. and his father. Was also a big character in the podcast. Yeah. But I think it was something to see them here together mm. yes. talking. And I still got a kind of a sense that the father, I forget the father's name. but He's not comfortable. That no, he, yeah. he pretended he was, though. He tried. I feel <laughs> so bad for the kid. I feel yeah. like he's trying to get there. Yeah. But Good on him for trying. But when his son talks about being gay and he's still wiping tears from his eyes as if it's the worst thing that ever happened to him, it makes me incredibly sad really for the like son. That. I think if I think if anything he was he was regretful yeah. of decisions yeah. he had made I don't in, disagree in, with in that. dealing with his yeah. kid growing yeah. up. No, you're right. But also it's very sad that the hero of Aaron Hernandez's life is his father, who was also like a huge homophobe. Yeah. It's sad. Correct. The father to me, again, like I took away more from this in watching this and watching like the old video clip of his father who was like the football star um, in Connecticut in the same town in Bristol before Aaron's day. But, you know, I really, I guess, took away more from this storytelling version of it. The, the father really kept him, even though there were issues with his father, and I think that the abuse and all of that was covered a lot more in depth in the podcast, but... I really took away from this the sense that the father really kept him on the straight and narrow. And as soon as his father died, things just went off the rails. And that was where, you know, you saw, you know, there's there's good and bad to having that level of structure. But it seemed like for Aaron Hernandez, he needed that structure on some level because once it was gone, all the shit hit the fan. And it just went all over the place with everything that was happening with him getting in trouble and hanging out with people that were getting in trouble. And, you know, so it was kind of one of those, like, which is the the lesser of two evils, having this father who was, you know, very hard driving and, and, and by accounts in the, you know, other reporting that we've listened to abusive, wasn't he? Wasn't that? Yeah. 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 And then, you know, and this one we're seeing that, uh, you know, there's that side, but then there was something to that that kept, Aaron focused and not going into these sort of side pursuits that were landing him in areas where he was getting in trouble. So I just want to talk about CTE because in this documentary, we actually able to see a picture of Aaron yeah. Hernandez's brain post mortem. They, you know, have a scientist who shows mm-hmm. us like this is what his brain looked like, this normal brain looks like, and he had this incredibly advanced case of CTE. And, and then you know the show debates whether or not basically like. Uh, they, or they let us see the debate of whether or not his CTE contributed to his violence. I think that's a debate that we can't really answer. The thing I always wonder when I see these photos of football players and they say, this is an extreme case of CTE, it's unprecedented. They only have the brain sliced open because the person's dead. Yeah. And I always wonder, does every single football player's brain look just like the one we just saw? A lot and, of people are asking that. And the only reason that they're saying it's extreme is because the person's dead. It's really something. I think it's extreme because he's so young. A lot of the brains they have are, are of veteran players. Some of the deterioration is because of age, and some of it is you had the CT for a long time. So we don't we don't have sort of the timeline of, uh, of how a brain uh, degenerates like that. But to see, you know, how the brain was at his age, at 27 when he died, versus how it might have been. 
if he died at 45 or 55 or 85 um, is hard to say, but I guess they were surprised to see in a younger brain that. Hmm. One thing I just want to ask you guys about real quick before we wrap up, the documentary really gets into the trials and the legal procedural around this case in a way that to me is very interesting. There was the Odin Lloyd trial and the trials for the other two murders, and he switched lawyers. And there was a lot of like legal changes between the two. Aaron Hernandez was in prison, but then he decided to fight and actually won. I found the court stuff very interesting. Toby, what did you think of that section of the documentary? Yeah, the the stuff about the case against of of him killing the two guys from Cape Verde and how that kind of fell apart and how that lawyer who was with Casey Anthony too, you know, the defense he put up was super interesting and really effective. And then somebody said when Hernandez was like crying afterwards, he's like, well, he was crying because he wished he'd had that guy as his lawyer on the Odin Lloyd case. I, I thought the guy was super impressive in his, I mean, you obviously only just see little cuts of it or whatever. It was pretty effective. So yeah, so I thought I thought those parts those parts were interesting. All right, guys. So let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know. Should they check out Killer Inside, The Mind of Aaron Hernandez, a new documentary from Netflix. Laura Bricker, I'm going to start with you. What do you think? Um, well, I'm going to say I am not a football person, so I don't think I necessarily would have watched this if it wasn't that we were reviewing it. However, if you are interested in football, if you're interested in crime, if you didn't listen to the podcast about this, this is a good overview of the case. There's a lot of really interesting courtroom information in there that they follow along with the case. Lots of clips that are really interesting about his career and kind of, you know, putting some insight into what a big deal he was at the time that this murder happened. So I would say if that's your thing, thumbs up. Um, if you're like me and you're not into football, I mean, there's plenty of cat videos out in the world. So, I mean, it's a toss up. <laughs> All right. What about you, Toby? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Killer Inside, The Mind of Aaron Hernandez on Netflix. I, I'd give it a thumbs up. I, mean, I, think it, I think it's well done. It's different than the podcast and... In some ways, I think it's better as just sort of like a crime documentary and with the court scenes like you like you mentioned. So I th yeah, I definitely think it's worthwhile. even if you even if you listen to the podcast and feel like you've got all you needed from that, I, I mean, I think there's more there's more here too. Kevin, what about you? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Killer Inside, The Mind of Aaron Hernandez. I'm a thumbs up. I, I think sometimes it's unfortunate when we have stories that are covered in other media and we are, they're competing against each other, like the, the Bikram one recently or uh, Bundy, you know, when we're trying to compare one piece of art with another. So I'm just going to take this on its own as opposed to comparing it to the Gladiator podcast. I think this was a good overview. It certainly brought a lot to light, new insight about... Hernandez's upbringing and uh, his sexuality and how that may have played a part in his uh, maladjustment uh, in professional sports and in his, prof in his personal life. And uh, we get to hear much more of him in his own voice through these recorded jailhouse telephone calls. So I think it's a good overview on a case that people will be talking about for a long, long time. Thumbs up. Yeah, I really liked it, too. I don't actually think you need to care a lot about football to find this interesting true crime story. Uh, if I were to compare it side by side with the podcast, I'd say it's different in some ways inferior and in other ways superior. I do think that the procedural stuff, the actual crime stuff was better done in the documentary than it was in the podcast even though the podcast did a better job taking the football institutions to task in terms of their culpability in enabling a guy who very likely killed three people, not just one person. Um, so I give it this a thumbs up. I think our listeners will like it, even if they don't think they are, you know, super interested in sports. It's just a really solid well put together overview of a true crime in true crime documentary format. So thumbs up for me. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, a little something we like to call the crime, crime of the week. Of the week. There's a brand new kids book getting a hell of a lot of attention. Aaron Layton's publication, A Children's Book of Demons, is a picture and activity book for kids ages 5 to 10. Publishers Weekly calls it, quote, a playful guide that invites readers to conjure gentle demons by writing their sigils. Among the Hellions include Flatulus, whose talent is passing gas, and Spanglox, 
who's the best dressed demon in the underworld. But a book that encourages children to summon their own demons is not sitting well with everyone. The president of the International Association of Exorcists says, quote, you don't mess around with demons. I subscribe to their oh, podcast. Oh, God. Fuck you. <laughs> and, one blo- and one mommy blogger says, and by the way, fuck all mommy bloggers says, the spirit world is real and it is no laughing matter. As of today, the Children's Book of Demons is ranked number 4,947 on Amazon's Children's Fantasy and Magic Books chart. So, panel, my question for you is, if this book had been around when you were a kid and you could summon a demon, what kind of mischief would you get into? Laura Bricker, what do you think? Um, Well, seeing as how I always liked to spy and eavesdrop on people, and I still like to do that, um, I think I would have summoned a demon to do that for me and um, listen in on some conversations and find out what was happening. Same for me. Toby Mm -hmm. Ball, what about you? If uh, this book had been around when you were a kid, what kind of demon would you have summoned so you could get into what kind of trouble? Uh. Whatever one brings you Zagnut bars. <laughs> <laughs> that is a callback, Toby Ball. Kevin Flynn, what about you? If this book had been around when you were a kid and you could summon a demon, what kind of mischief would you have gotten into? I would have gone to school and summoned uh, Lucullus, and I would have had that demon spit into Mike Lanville's potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Mike Lanville? Somebody wasn't very nice to me. Anyone out there knows Mike Lanville? You let me know. Ooh. I have some words for that guy. All right, we should probably wrap it up on that. Now, before we do, Lara Bricker, do we have a cat of the week this week? Um, we have an interesting sort of theme this week. So I don't know if anybody saw this story that went viral about the cat in the North Carolina shelter, Perdita. Yes. The, oh, world's, the world's worst cat. Worst cat. <laughs> She's just a jerk. So I put a picture of Perdita with her her ad and up in our uh, Crime Matters on Discussion group. And I said, this cat just needs some love. Oh, my God. It turns out. Everyone's always nominating their nice animals to us. So many of our listeners have asshole cats. So I'm going to read you a few excerpts of people's asshole cats from our listeners. Allie Mariano, who's always trying to get me to try hot yoga. She had a cat named uh, Pebbles. Everyone is afraid of. We were so nice to her and she was just an asshole. Mm. Summer George had a cat. Her name is Sybil. She's beautiful and temperamental, enjoys exactly two pets at a time, and then she bites you. I wouldn't be able to rehome her even if I wanted to. Mm. Tom Haggy, one of our regular listeners. My first cat was yes. like this. I didn't think I liked cats until my wife brought her home. She bit our friends, scratched our arms. I liked that cat. We bonded. She did herself in, though, by repeatedly urinating on our new baby stuffed animals. I came home uh. one day and the cat was gone. Um, but they, they go on and on and on. And I was just laughing hysterically at everybody with their asshole jerk cats because cats can be a little bit like that. Um, so it was a lot of fun hearing about all of the cats out in Crime Murders on Land that might be waiting to kill someone. And uh, I'll be right there to do a podcast if that happens. Laura, how many people told you about their super asshole dogs? Oh, none? I rest none. my case. All right. Laura Bricker, if folks want to reach out to you and tell you more about their asshole cats, how can they find you on Twitter? They can find me at Laura Bricker. Laura Bricker, you, I feel like you just want to make a last plea, like an argument for like, cats, uh, cats versus dogs. Cats are the best. Well, my cats are, all, my cats are all awesome. Even Zelda, who doesn't come out. But here's Dexter. They also call him Dixter. He inter. Uh, I mean, I like it. Just went on and on. Um, this is what <laughs> makes life with cats interesting, you know. Yes, because they're assholes. Toby Ball, folks want to reach out to you and say it's okay that you also have cats, Toby Ball, even though they're assholes. How can they find you on Twitter? At Toby Ball and H. <laughs> and Kevin Flynn, folks want to reach out to you and tell you they hope you make your super early flight tomorrow morning. How can they find you on Twitter? I'm at Kevin P Flynn. And if you want to find me on Twitter or Instagram, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On, and I encourage you to join the amazing community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. We also have a regular old Facebook page, by the way. Support the show on patreon.com slash partners in crime media, and you will get the Crime Writers On After Show, Mary with Podcast, Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club Podcast, and Laura Bricker's Leave It to Bricker Podcast. Our theme song was performed by the New York Sky Jazz Ensemble and used with permission. Our line editor is the very handsome Henry Lavoie. Our social media and newsletter maven is fellow 
Taco Bell Stan, Meredith Plunkett, and this show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our basement where we live our lives by the Patriot way every day. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. All right, well, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out, Kevin, what is actually the name of this thing? What's the full name of it? Killer Inside. Since is it Killer Inside, the Aaron Killer Hernandez? Killer Mine? No. Yeah, hold on. Killer Inside, the Mine of Aaron Hernandez. I, I just feel like we keep getting it the wrong. The Killer Inside. Killer Inside. <laughs> okay. The Mine of Aaron Hernandez. All right, so let's do what we do. Should our listeners check out Killer Inside, the Mind of, Her- of Aaron Hernandez? <laughs> Sorry, again. It just feels like so stupid that I'm laughing during it because I can't remember the name. It is. They changed the Heron name. Aaron Hernandez. They changed the name. Kevin and I watched these screeners and it had a whole different name. So let's do what we do. Let our listeners know: Should they check out Killer Inside, the Mind of Aaron Hernandez? Aaron Hernandez. <laughs> Hernandez. <laughs> 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 I just pee a little. Sorry. We're talking about murder. Partners in in crime crime media. media. Save big money on Clearview Cabinetry. Clearview Cabinetry starts as a kitchen built for now and grows with you as life changes. It's flexible by design with full access cabinet construction. So you can go from doors to drawers for storage that works when you need it. Explore Clearview's cabinet options in store and on Menards.com and save big money today. Big buys, big savings. Check out more of our great deals going on now at Menards. Save big money at Menards.